In Mark chapter 2 verse 1 through chapter 3 verse 6, we read of a series of five confrontations or controversies, if you will. These controversies are between Jesus and the religious leaders. And they culminate in Mark 3 verse 6 with the religious leaders deciding that they needed to destroy Jesus. A few chapters later, or a little bit later in that same chapter 3 in verse 22, the religious leaders appear again. And when they get to where they're going, they're, they're still in something of a confrontational mood. In a, in a mood that they're, they're, they just... They see Jesus and, and they accuse Him of driving out demons and performing miracles by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. We don't hear of the religious leaders again until we come now to Mark chapter 7. If you would open up your Bibles to Mark 7. The religious leaders on the scene again, some of them having traveled from Jerusalem for this very purpose, to confront Jesus. And yet again, they are spoiling for a fight. Verbally anyway, for right now. Uh, not necessarily physically, at least not yet. This time the issue is ritual hand washing. Now I'm sure all of us have been to a restaurant and in that restaurant we go to the restroom and we see over the sink employees must wash hands before returning to work. And then a lovely little chart that tells you exactly how you're supposed to wash your hands. Well that's for sanitary reasons, right? We understand that, there, that, that if you're going to be handling food being served, well, even to yourself, let alone to others, you need to have your hands properly cleaned. Well, the hand washing that's in question here is not sanitary based. This is ritual based. It is based on traditions. Please follow along as I read Mark 7, <coughs> verses 1 through 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and of copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, these, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said this to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things do you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within 
and defile a person. The Old Testament is, is very uh, concerned with religious cleanliness. In fact, the, the priests were commanded that before they could serve in the tabernacle or later the temple, that they had to wash their hands and feet. Uh, Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21 tell us about what those requirements were. But at some point in the Jews' history, before the first century, this hand washing ritual. Uh, and this practice had extended from beyond the priest and their service in the temple or the tabernacle to include all of the all of the Jews, the general population, and even various common articles as well. <coughs> Excuse me. But before we get into that, let's let's begin by taking a look at the criticism. The criticism that the, the Jews have of Jesus. Well, not necessarily of Jesus, but of Jesus' disciples. It starts, ba the basic thrust of it is he's violating traditions. Now, you might say, wait, I thought it was hand washing. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But the big problem that they have with him is that he is violating tradition. Now, all parties involved, Jesus, the Pharisees, the scribes, everyone that was there, they knew this was they were talking about a tradition. In fact, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were not claiming that it was a part of the Mosaic law. If you look carefully at verse 5, it says, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? <coughs> Excuse me. They knew. They knew that what they were talking about was a tradition and not an actual part of the law. They knew that hand washing was a part of the tradition of the elders. However, the Pharisees took ancient tradition very seriously. Very, very seriously they took these ancient traditions. The, Pharise the word Pharisee, in fact, means the separated ones. And do you know what separated the Pharisees from the general population? Was their observance of these traditions. Their observance not just of the law and of what the law said do and don't do, but of, the of, of these traditions, of their interpretations of the law that they had given equal authority to the law. Now, we have to ask, uh, were these traditions as binding as the written word? Since they could, in theory anyway, trace these traditions all the way back to the time of Moses. Well, d since that was the case, did they have the same status as, as the law did? Well, that actually was a serious point of debate for the scholars of the Jewish nation. And in fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had really animated, heated arguments over tradition because the Sadducees didn't see it as that important. The Pharisees did. And so, you know, it was, it was a point of scholarly debate. But there was no debating that they considered the traditions of the elders to be ancient and quite important. So of that we can be sure. Whether or not it had equal authority to the Word, the written Word, the actual law of Moses, we, we don't know for sure. But the point is, they were very adamant and very, took it very seriously. Now, what about the issue of washing? Well, as we do today, there's a proper way to wash your hands. They had a proper way of washing their hands as well. I believe it went something like this. You took your right fist after you had wet, got your hands wet and you put it in the palm of your left hand and rubbed. Then you took your left hand and made a fist and put it in the palm of your right hand and rubbed. And then you had to hold your hands up until the water dripped all the way down and came off your elbow. Once it did that, then you did the whole process again, but this time you held your hands down until the water ran off of your fingertips. 
And only then were your hands ceremonially clean enough to eat or to do whatever. It had, it had nothing to do with hygiene. Everything to do with tradition. The tradition of the elders. But they also, not just for the washing of hands, but they had a proper washing of everything else too. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. They had a way to wash it. Uh, the text here says when they come from the market, they would wash. Or some versions may have that uh, washing whatever they bring from the market. It didn't, didn't matter what it was. If it was sold or, or handled by a Gentile, it had to be washed. It had to be ceremonially purified. Dishes, etc. Again, mostly nothing to do with hygiene or making sure the, that you know, the last thing that you cooked in the pot wasn't still in the pot. You know, it had to do with ceremony. It had to do with tradition. Well, that's the criticism of Jesus' disciples. They're violating the traditions by eating with hands that are defiled. Defiled, not dirty, okay? This isn't the case of you know, the disciples eating with hands that were not clean, per se, but more just that they weren't eating with, hand, with, with hands that had been ceremonially cleaned. Well, the answer, Jesus doesn't directly answer their criticism, at least not yet. He begins with a critique of their emphasis on tradition. And his critique is that some traditions contradicted the will of God. Not just the will of God, but the Word of God as well. You know, traditions can be good. They, they, they can be good. I mean, we, we have some traditions in the church of Christ that, that, are, that are good. However, we have to be very careful to make sure that our traditions don't get the equal authority to what the Word of God has to say. That the, our traditions are recognized as just that, our, in tr our, our traditions. And if our traditions ever get to the point where they contradict the will or the Word of God, then we need to understand that we need to get rid of the tradition and not get rid of the Word of God or not ignore the Word of God for the sake of our traditions. And Jesus backs all this up by, looking at, by citing Isaiah 29 verse 13. See, like Isaiah's contemporaries, the Pharisees, some of them anyway, were only giving lip service to God. They would say all the right things, but deep down in their heart, they weren't right. They weren't true. It wasn't something that they really meant. And they would, they would teach as doctrine, and doctrine is a fancy way of saying teaching it as God's will, they would teach us doctrine, the commandments of men. They would say, well, you know, the, the law says this, but we say this, and what we say is the official line, and that's what you have to go with, and that's what you have to do. Thus, their claim to honor God was hypocritical. Because worshipers of God not only claim to do His commandments, not only do they claim to follow His will, they actually do it. Their actions speak in harmony with what they were professing, with what their words say. And then Jesus gives them an example, an illustration of tradition. The Corban Oath. Now, in the Corban Oath, the person or the possession was declared to be a gift to God. In other words, you would say, well, I hereby pledge this, whatever possession it is, to God. It, 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 it belongs to God. Now, if you did that with a possession, then you could still use the possession, but you could not give that possession to anybody else because you'd already given it to God. So for example, if we were up here at the church building sometime and doing a little bit of work on, on something and I had a hammer and I was using the hammer and you needed a hammer and you said, Carl, can I use your hammer? And I would have to say, I've actually 
committed the hammer to God, so no, you can't use my hammer. See, that's, that's, it sounds silly almost, but that's the seriousness of it. And on the surface, it's not a bad thing. I mean, after all, God has given us everything that we have. Why shouldn't we be willing to give whatever we have back to God? On the surface, it sounds like a good thing, but it could get sort of silly, sort of, sort of ridiculous, really. Uh, it, it, so Jesus cites two scriptures. The first scripture he cites is Exodus 20, verse 12. He says, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. Does anybody recognize... Exodus 20, verse 12, what that is. You remember the, the fairly famous Ten Commandments? This is commandment number five. So number five of the top ten, honor your father and mother. Second citation that he gives is from Exodus 21, verse 17, or Leviticus 20, verse 9. It appears in both passages. And that is, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die I would say based on those two scriptures that our treatment of our mother and our father is a pretty big deal to God I believe that it is and Jesus's understanding of such is that honoring your parents includes taking care of them looking after them making sure that they're okay uh, that's how you honor them but to apply the Corban tradition to parents actually would prohibit a man from caring for his parents. Because if, if, a, if a person said, okay, I've made this much money, it's in my savings account, and it is Corban, it is dedicated to God, which means I can still use it however I really want to, but I can't give it to anybody else. So you have a parent who has some issues, some problems, what have you, they need some money, you can't take it out of that, that savings account and give it to them because it has been dedicated to God. Thus, by their tradition, it led to violations of the commandments given by God to Moses. In fact, if you really wanted to apply this properly, by dedicating that savings account or whatever to God and not being able to use it to care for your parents you would be in violation of the fifth of the Ten Commandments. You would be reviling your parents. And guess what? You'd die. It's that simple. That's what the law said. You revile your parents. You don't honor your mother and your father. You die. Pretty simple. How's that for tradition versus the commandment of God? Well, after he gives them this answer, Jesus then, apparently, the, the religious leaders maybe leave or, or go away, or, or he calls the crowds off to the side. I don't know, but uh, somehow then he gets to the people and he tells them the real issue. The real issue that the, that the, the religious leaders had with the disciples, with Jesus, because Jesus, as their leader, was supposed to teach them how to do all this stuff, and he obviously wasn't. He starts off with the parable. Put parable in quotation marks because really it's a metaphorical saying, okay? It's not really a parable. Mark calls it a parable, uh, or at least that's how the word is translated in, in the um, um, English Standard Version that I have here. But, uh, but verse 15, it's, it's a metaphorical saying. Basically what he says is what goes into the body doesn't defile a person. What goes into a body, it, it goes into the body, it goes through the body, and it exits the body. You know, it provides nourishment in the meantime and everything, but, but, uh, but, but what, you, what you eat it isn't, uh, isn't going to defile you. But he does say what comes out of the heart defiles a person. Because what comes out of the heart comes from the deepest, the very base of who a person really is. And that is what makes a person clean or unclean. 
But so what? What's the application for us? How does this have to do with us? How does it have to do with them? Well, you have to take care of what goes into your heart. And notice when I say the word heart, I'm pointing up here, not right here, okay? Your heart, in this instance, is your brain, okay? That, that's where all of these ideas formulate. Uh, so you have to take care of what goes into your heart. Now, how do you control what goes into your heart up here in your head? Well, you take care about the type of media that you watch. You take care about what you listen to. You take care about what you uh, feel. How do you take care of what you feel? You watch where you go, okay? Uh, you know, what, what you watch, what you hear, what you, where you go, what you feel, um, smell. Yeah, you, you make sure that what goes in up here isn't bad things. Because just like with computers, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, garbage is going to come out. That's just the way that it works. And so uh, take care of what goes into your heart and take care of what comes out of your heart. Because out of the heart comes all manner of evil. And he gives some examples in verses 21 through 23. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Other thing, those are just some examples. But you know, even as you read through that list, sometimes you think, well, that's not so bad. But yet Jesus puts it with some stuff that is bad. You know, you know envy, you know, well, I mean, yeah, 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 if you carry it to an excess, but, you know, if I see something that somebody has and I say, I want something like that, that that's not so bad, is it? Well, if it becomes envy, it becomes bad. You know, and so we have to understand that, uh, that, that you know, Jesus groups these together to let us know that, you know, sin is sin, Period. And my friends, this is just as applicable in the 21st century as it was in the 1st century. Even more so. Even more so. I mean, the opportunities for garbage to go into the heart today are far more than they were in the 1st century or even just in the last century. You know, the internet can be a great thing. It can also be a bad thing too. We have to be aware of that and be able to control what goes into our heart so we can control what comes out of our heart and what we say, where we go, and what we do. Friends, traditions can be a good thing. A lot of families have traditions, especially around this time of the year with Thanksgiving and Christmas and in some instances squashing them all together for Thanksmas. That's what we do in, uh, on my side of the family. You know, it's a, it's a tradition, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's a great thing. And uh, even religious traditions, are, are, they're, not that, they're not bad, per se. However, traditions can become a bad thing. Traditions can become a bad thing when we give them equal authority to the Word of God in our conduct, or when we allow them to take precedence over the Word of God. There are, believe it or not, some religious bodies who uh, say, well, we know what the Bible says, but this is what we like to do, and so this is what we do over here, regardless of what the Bible says. Well, that's a very dangerous position to, to be in and, and to take. Because anytime what I think contradicts what the Word of God thinks, I need to change my thinking. We have another tradition here. That we give an opportunity, if things aren't right between you and God, for you to make them right between you and God. Sometimes that involves just something private where you're at. Sometimes it, it requires and needs a public response. Maybe that public response is uh, to begin your walk with Christ by being immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe that public response is asking this church family to pray with you and to pray for you so that you can be a better example, so that you can live your life dedicated to God, which means 
serving other people, by the way. If we, if we can help you in some way to make things right between you and God, whatever that is, don't leave here with that need. But if it involves something public that you'd like to make known, please come to the front now as we stand and sing together.